Hello and thanks for watching. Before we start our uh, presentation, I just want to introduce myself and give you a little bit of background as to why this uh, subject is personally interesting to, to me. Um, my name is uh, Darren Taporis. I live in Australia um, in a city called Newcastle. I'm married to Susan. We've been married for uh, 30 years, or over 30 years, I should say. Uh, I have five children. Uh, two of my older sons have grown up and I still have three daughters who live with me at home. Um, Susan and myself are both very serious Bible believers. We read the Bible every day. We are keenly interested in what the Bible has to say and the, we take the Bible to be our guide for our life. I am a Christadelphian. I've been baptised as a Christadelphian for over 30 years. Um, and this is part of what I want to talk about in this presentation today. In my day-to-day -day life, I, from time to time, come across uh, others who are believers, who take uh, the Bible as God's word, and I like to share my faith with them and talk about um, the incredible blessings we have um, in Christ and to talk about the gospel and, and my faith. However, Often when I talk to uh, people I come across and they find out that I'm a Christadelphian uh, and they particularly find out that I don't believe in the Trinity, they often are concerned or sometimes disappointed or bewildered or confused as to why um, people like myself who love God's word, love the Bible, take it seriously, don't believe in the Trinity because the Trinity has become one of those um, orthodox doctrines, or in fact, arguably the orthodox doctrine to define Christianity by. And I want to talk a little bit about that in our session here now. Um, I remember even as a young person, I was on a, a committee that organized um, youth camps. And I remember applying to use Christian facilities for our camps and being told that because I was a Christadelphian, because we were a Christadelphian organization, because we didn't believe in the Trinity, we were not considered to be Christians and therefore not able to use these facilities. So it is a, an interesting perspective that people have that, that the Trinity defines Christianity. And I want to explain in this video to my Christian friends, to um, clients that are believers that I've talked with, to my own family members in some cases, uh, why I don't believe in the Trinity uh, over these two particular sessions. The irony is the, that the Trinity was not actually believed by the first Christians. And this, is, this makes this subject r rather interesting. Um, the Trinity itself is not mentioned in the Bible. The Trinity as it's believed today and as it's formulated in the Nicene Creed, for example, is not explicitly taught in the Bible at all. Um, there is no evidence the first century Christians believed in the Trinity. In fact, the documentation we do have from the first century would seem to say uh, the opposite of that. Also, as we look into history from the first century onwards, the second and the third century, the second and third century Christians did not believe in the Trinity as it would be defined later on. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And in fact, it was not until the fourth century after Christ was born that we have the doctrine of the Trinity as we understand it today, the Nicene Creed in 325, it becomes then the um, orthodox official doctrine of, of the church. Just an, an extract here from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, just a, um, an authority on the history of religion, and it quite clearly states, and there are many references we could have given here, no theologian in the first three Christian centuries was a Trinitarian in the sense that they believed in the, the, the formula of, of the Trinity. So this doctrine wasn't believed by the first Christians. It wasn't even believed in the first 200 years or so, or even 300 years. It did not become defined as it is today until the fourth century. And that's what we want to think about and look at in our session. To try and um, frame our thoughts, I've just designed a little screen here that presents the two different worldviews that we can look at this subject from. The Orthodox Christian worldview 
states that the formula for the Trinity wasn't um, defined until the fourth century, which means the early Christians didn't really understand this subject fully. And it wasn't until later on, four centuries in, that the doctrine of Jesus and his relationship with God is fully understood as it is now um, documented and defined and articulated in the, in the creeds of Christianity. And so that implies there was a progress and a development in understanding by the Christian community. The early Christians didn't quite understand it completely. Over time, this, the, the subject and the doctrine evolves and is developed until we get to a full understanding later on, centuries after Christ. So that's the orthodox traditional view of this subject, uh, that the church fathers would build upon the knowledge they received from the early Christians until this doctrine is completely understood. The Christadelphian view is really virtually the opposite of that. We believe that the early Christians, the apostles particularly, understood this doctrine completely and fully. They had a full understanding of Jesus and God and their relationship. And in fact, rather than a progress of, and a development of understanding, there is a corruption in understanding this subject. It actually is the opposite. And the true, the true understanding of this subject deteriorates over time until we have an apostasy, which is the term from the Bible, or a, a falling away is what it means from the original teaching. And that you see there's two quite different perspectives there. One, we progress in our knowledge from the apostles. The other, we actually, it, the true understanding from the apostles deteriorates and is corrupted over time, leading to a falling away. Now, this subject is complicated. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. We have Jesus Christ presented to us in the New Testament, a very unique um, individual, of course, totally unique. He's on one hand, son of God. On the other hand, he's son of man. One, on one hand, he's the very begotten son of God. And on the other hand, he's human. The Bible presents us, presents Jesus to us as having no human father. God is his actual father. The New Testament calls him the only begotten son of God. And so there are many Bible verses that emphasize uh, the divine origins of Jesus, the fact that he is the son of God. And so his divine sonship, sonship is, is emphasized in certain verses. On the other hand, there are certain verses that emphasize the fact that he's human, that he was born of a human mother, Mary, of course. And so there are many Bible verses that emphasize his humanity. So how do we, how do we um, reconcile this paradox that we have between son of God and son of man? And we want to look at where we go to find the answers to that, because that is really at the, the heart of our, our thoughts. So let's just uh, recalibrate here our thinking here. The Christadelphian view that we want to present is that the apostles had a complete and a full understanding of God and his relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. That understanding becomes corrupted over time and it leads to an apostasy or a falling away from that truth. So let's look at first the biblical um, data behind that claim, and then we'll look at some historical facts as well to see if that can be supported. Firstly, let's look at the uh, a sample, and I emphasize these are just sample verses. There are many verses I could have put here, um, and I'm only just sort of skimming the surface, really. In fact, you could say the, the whole fabric of the New Testament contains um, the uh, anxiety, if you like, or, or the warning that that corruption will come into the early uh, community of believers. And it's really... In every epistle and every letter, it's found to some extent. These samples are very explicit ones that I've just chosen. Now, we, of course, would encourage you to read these verses in your own Bible. Uh, I've just put some summaries up on the screen to help us move through the subject. So this is the writings of the Apostle Paul, um, inspired, of course, by God, written in about AD 52, about halfway through the first century. And he says, and he predicts here a future what he calls a falling away, as it says in the English Bible. So there will come a falling away. That 
Greek word that underlies that English phrase. Um, apostasia is a word that means a departure or a falling away. And Paul says, I told you these things. I'm not just writing to you now and, and are telling you there's going to be a, a, a massive falling away or a wholesale departure from, from uh, true understanding. He says in verse 5, as we've got there on the screen, remember when I was with you, when I was living with you, I told you these things. Um, and so there's going to come a complete wholesale departure. And I have been telling you this for some time. But verse 7 is also interesting. And we're going to see this concept repeated. The falling away that is to come in the future has already started. The seeds have already been sown and is already at work. So that's from the Apostle Paul uh, writing in the first century. There's going to be a falling away. I've warned you about this for some time, and it's already uh, at play here. Here's another example. This is from the Apostle Peter this time. Uh, in 2 Peter 2, he says, just as there were false prophets in the history of Israel, so there are going to be first false prophets in the early um, congregation and the early uh, community of believers. There'll be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. And it's not just going to be on the fringes or in part, he says, many will follow their destructive ways. So there we've got Paul warning us. Now we've got the apostle Peter warning us. Here we've got a, another warning in the book of Acts. Again, it's the apostle Paul, the story of the apostle Paul, but it's recorded by Luke. Um, in about AD 62, and um, the Apostle Paul is talking to the leaders of, of a community, a Christian community, and he says, I know that after my departure, after Paul would leave them and eventually he was executed, he says, savage wolves would come in among you, not sparing the flock, also from among yourselves, from within the, the, the community, um, Men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And look at the emotion and the, um, the anxiety that Paul exhibits here. He says, I've, I'm not just telling you this now. I've been telling you this for years. He says, watch and remember that for three years when I was living with you, I didn't stop to warn you. And it wasn't just occasionally. He says, day and night I warned you. And it wasn't just a throwaway line or a, um, an academic warning. He said, I, I warned you in tears. So there is an anxiety here um, in the words of Paul recorded in scripture that there would be this, this falling away. Now, there are many verses we could look at, but some of them give us a hint as to where this falling away would come from. And here's another uh, reference in the New Testament. Again, it's the writings of the Apostle Paul, Colossians 2. And he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. So this is now a very clear indication, a very strong hint as to where we look to find the source and the root of this corruption that would come into Christianity. He says it's philosophy based on human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world. Philosophy Human philosophy based in the traditions of the world, not according to Christ, would be the source of this problem. And this is really important too. This is written by the Apostle John towards the end of the first century, probably in the, in the 90s. Um, John's writing right towards the end of the first century. He would be the last apostle uh, to die. And he's warning us that these philosophies are not just theoretical things. They actually will affect our understanding of God and Jesus Christ. And he says, "Don't, beloved, don't believe every spirit, every philosophy, every teaching, but test the spirits to see whether they're of God. And he says, by this you'll know the spirits from God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, now flesh is a word that means human nature, is from God. But every philosophy or teaching that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is not of God. And this, in fact, is the teaching or the spirit of the Antichrist or those against Christ, which you have heard. And again, he emphasizes that they, they have been warned about this. It was coming. 
but he also says it's now already here. It's already in the world. This teaching had already taken place. And most um, commentators would um, agree that uh, this is referring to Gnosticism, which was an early Christian heresy that said that Jesus didn't really come in human nature. He only appeared to come in human nature. It's sometimes called docetism, which means that appearance, that Jesus only appeared to be a human. So these philosophies were, would affect the teachings of the early apostles and change them. And they would impact the way people saw who Jesus really was. And in this case, it's de-emphasizing the humanity of Jesus that is really at the heart of this wrong teaching. So we've had warnings of a wholesale departure from Bible teaching. We saw those in the writings of the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, um, uh, the Apostle John, in the writings of Acts and in Colossians, etc. We were also told in those passages that the false teaching was already at work. The seeds had already been sowed even when the apostles were still alive. It had not flowered yet, but it had been sowed. And this false teaching is identified by, by, for us by uh, the writers of the New Testament as human philosophy. So this is where we need to look. So let's just recalibrate our thinking here. The Christadelphian worldview is the apostles understood they were inspired by God. They, in fact, were inspired to write much of the New Testament. They had the gift of the Spirit. Um, they were given the comforter by Jesus to understand uh, true teachings of God. So we have absolute confidence the apostles knew what they were talking about and they had a complete understanding of God's truth. They understood the nature of Jesus and that would be corrupted over time and would lead to a falling away or an apostasy, a, re a wholesale departure from, from true biblical truth. Now, what is the source of that corruption? Where did it come from? How did it enter the early Christian community? Well, we've had some clues from the New Testament that it would come through human philosophy. And where was that human philosophy found or where did it come from? If we go back 300 years before Christ, we have the philosophical um, fathers, if you like, of Western civilization, men like Socrates, his famous student Plato, who would record not only um, his own philosophies, but those of Socrates and Socrates and Plato um, and had a student who was Aristotle, or he was a famous student of Plato's Aristotle. And these three philosophers would change the course of, of human history in many ways. They are the, the fathers of, of Western civilization. And they gave the world um, a philosophical base uh, that was focused on logic and thinking, and, and, uh, and it really changed human history and particularly the Western, the Western world. Um, Here's an extract from Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is not always considered the, 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 the premier um, encyclopedia, but it's accessible and it's free. So I thought I would use it. And if you want to drill down into the references that Wikipedia give to find more information, you can. Plato's a philosopher. Uh, he lived about 300 years or so before um, the birth of Jesus Christ. He founded the Academy, which was his school. And that's where we get the word academic from today and academy from. Um, he's considered to be a pivotal figure in the history of, the, of, of ancient Greece, but also in Western philosophy. But as you read on, it gets more interesting. He's also one of the founders of Western religion and spirituality. And you're thinking, how does that work? He's a pagan who lives in ancient Greece. And yet here he's called a founder of Western religion, which is Christianity. Well, if you read further, you'll see that Plato had a major influence on the early church fathers, men like Augustine, for example, and they then would synthesize Plato's teaching into early Christianity. This is not just um, my idea, of course. This is well documented in history. Here's an extract from uh, a writer that many of us may have heard of, Dr. James Strong, who wrote the Strong's Concordance. He tells us that um, during the first and second century, um, many learned men came over from Judaism and paganism and they brought with them platonic ideas, philosophical concepts from Plato into the early Christian community. And this then becomes the source of, of the, the corruption and the change that would come into early Christianity. Just a really, really um, crash course on 
Plato's overall philosophies. Plato, Plato was what's called a dualist. He believed in two worlds, the physical world we live in and this spiritual world, um, which he calls the good. And the spiritual world contains all the, all the ideals and the ideas that can only be accessed by our human reasoning. It's an eternal world. And the physical world is the world we live in, um, which is corrupting and changing and, and uh, rusting and, and decaying, etc. And we experience the physical world by our senses. But we experience the, um, the, the other realm, the, the non-physical realm, by our thinking and our logic. So Plato's example is you might have a table, which is a physical object, but it's based on a concept that is found in the spiritual world and so a craftsman has made that table it's an imperfect flawed table in the physical form but it exists in a perfect form in the in the non-physical world in the spiritual world so in western philosophy and western the development of western culture these ideas have been used to develop um philosophy develop psychology develop many um, different ideas now that's all well and good but how does that tie into our subject today? Well, underlying Plato's theories was a metaphysics or a religious uh, platform. And remember, Plato was a pagan. He adopted many of the Egyptian concepts of, of the afterlife, etc. And he developed in his thinking a mediator or a go-between between the spiritual world and the physical world, which he called the demiurge. And this demiurge created the physical world. It was a, a lesser God, a go-between God. And so this idea of the demiurge would be adopted by Christian thinkers and Christian church leaders in the first and second and third centuries and be applied to Jesus Christ. And this is quite interesting. So the first century, we have the true apostolic teachings. It wasn't until the fourth century when we had the Nicene Creed which defined the Trinity as it is understood today. The apostolic era, we believe, had the truth of God's word and the true understanding of Jesus Christ. But in those centuries in between, we had this development taking place. And within that, those two centuries, tr the Trinity was not the dominant view. In fact, the dominant view was one that's down the bottom of that list called Proto-Orthodox. And that was the view of the early church fathers who fused Plato's ideas in with Christianity and started this idea of Jesus being a God or a lesser God initially. So men like the early church fathers, like Justin Martyr, very much were um, impressed by Plato's philosophies and Plato's thinking. The latter church fathers as well, men like Augustine, who's probably the most influential uh, church father, was very much um, immersed in Platonic ideas and it influenced him greatly. Justin Martyr, in this extract here from um, Wikipedia, it quotes from one of his own works where he basically says that the writings of, of Plato and the philosophers enabled him to understand God. And that is something that we find very much repeated in the uh, early church fathers. He even refers to the Platonic philosophers from ancient Greece as pre-Christians. They were in, in his apologetic writing that these men were were basically Christians, even though they did not understand Christ. Augustine, as I said, one of the most influential church fathers. If you read about him, he also was influenced by the writings of Plato. Augustine basically says everything he read in Plato agreed with Paul. So he put Plato on the same level as Paul. Eusebius, another church father, basically says that, that Plato took us to, to Christ. Clement of Alexander, Alexandria basically equates the writings of Plato with the law of Moses on the same footing and says that Plato was a schoolmaster to bring us to, to Christ. So basically, which worldview fits the biblical and historical data? The orthodox view that the apostles didn't understand the truth and later on the true understanding would emerge, that doesn't seem to fit with what the Bible says. The Christadelphian view says the apostles understood and there would be a corruption in that understanding that would lead to an apostasy. So yes, there is a paradox here. It's a complicated subject and needs to be um, thought about and understood and, and looked at carefully. But the answers do not lie in 
human philosophy in Platoism. The answers to unlock this paradox are found in the Old Testament. All the mechanisms we need to understand this paradox, the literary devices, the figures of speech, the symbols, all the interpretive um, devices we need to understand this paradox are found in the Old Testament. And that's where we need to look. So those of us who don't believe in the Trinity, you don't need to call us heretics. You don't need to fire us from our jobs. We would ask you to sit down with our Bibles and look at how we can understand this unique person, our Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, son of man, and understand him based on inspired Old Testament Bible writings rather than Platonic philosophies from the third century BC. Thank you. In our next session, we'll continue and look at how the writings of Plato not only affected the early church fathers, but would be developed to eventually lead to the Nicene Creed and the development of the Trinity. Thank you.